What does a one-sided object represent? The impossibility of the Disc of Odin. The howl of a wolf in the force of England, a sound possible in another time, another world, but no longer. Among the repertoire of Argentine author Jorge Luis Borges, events like this have an importance. The end of the wolves in England, the manifestation of the crucifixion in other guises, the confabulation of stories, the malicious other which parallels us, and then the dreamer who comes into contact with the impossible. Recurrent motifs of Borgiana, as it were, which include mirrors, masks, gauchos, Germanic mythology, labyrinths, memory, and infinity, totally expressed in words and objects. Throughout Borges short stories, objects which echo these events and ideas appear again and again, but the Disc of Odin, which falls into our hands, is one of the most excellent. It is an expression of Borges' affinity for mathematic tricks, mythology, and heaps of complex literary references. The short story El Disco is a two or three page short story, depending on language and formatting, about a truly one-sided object, the Disc of Odin, or the eponymous El Disco. A physical expression of a world which cannot exist, or at least exist any longer, a totem of dreams passing into reality, the story of a woodcutter in medieval England, or perhaps Saxony, murdering a pompous wanderer for an object he could never understand. The reader is given over totally to Borges' game in it, as, before he went blind, he preferred Argentine truco. Though, reading the disc as simple biography makes one blind to Borges' pure talent. The author called this the dialogue of ascetic and king, or the dialogue between nothing and something. The philosopher Heraclitus snubbing King Darius of Persia, Alexander the Great blocking Diogenes the dog's son, or the Greek king of the East Menander embracing the yellow robe of the holy man Nagasena's Buddhism. In philosophy and wisdom literature, there are many modes of this which appear again and again, a sort of morphology throughout human history. Though, as Borges opines, if one wishes to toy with zero and infinity, the figure of a dead god is far more economical, a divinity which fails its own eternity. The totality of an object which cannot exist, but does against both logic and mathematics. Now, Borges had already explored themes of mathematical impossibility in other short stories like The Library of Babel, The Aleph, and Fumis the Memorius. The source for the disc, though, was part interest in Germanic mythology, part the Buddhist-influenced philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, and part Austrian supernatural writer Gustav Meyerinck. The inspiration for Borges' story is likely Meyerinck's own short story, The Black Ball, a tale where a group of Hindu mystics are able to physically generate any idea a person can think of from white powder in a vial. The story is the origin for the concept of a black hole, as what brings about its end is a Prussian lieutenant thinking of literally nothing. This generates a slowly expanding mass of black nothingness that will eventually consume the entire world, if not universe. Meyerinck's short story ends in this very European 1800s interpretation of Eastern mysticism. The whole universe as it was created by Parama, sustained by Vishnu, and destroyed by Shiva will in due course sink into this hole, said Rajan Jala Mitra solemnly. This is the curse on us, brother, for coming to the West. What does it matter, Mabe Gosen? We must all in time enter into the negative realm of existence. The main crux, or cross, of Borges' short story is the eponymous disc. It is an object which is ingenious in its confounding simplicity. It is a flat disc of any theoretical material which can fit in one's palm, but it has only one side. It is not one-dimensional. No, Borges' disc has but only one side. The object can not only just be perceived from only one side, but only exists as a single side. Not in mathematical technicality like a Mobius strip or Klein bottle either, though Borges was obviously influenced by both concepts. The disc has three-dimensional weight and texture, but exists as only a single disembodied side. It is an impossible object, or sort of physical zen cone. The disc is a foreign object to this world, which, in conception, is a mechanistic world bound by physical laws. The disc does not adhere to any of them. 
In story, that disc is given a mythological face. The tale is three pages in English, and usually only two in Spanish. It is set against the backdrop of medieval England, implied to be just after the dusk of paganism and dawn of Christianity on the island. The plot is that of the bitter reminiscences of a now blind woodcutter, or leñador in Spanish, isolated in the darkness of the English woods. This woodcutter states his name does not matter, though his traits like blindness suggest a resemblance to the author Borges himself, as all Borges' main characters ultimately do. The man is soon to die in the same woods, in the same hut, in which he was born. He believes the woods go onto the ocean, but he has never seen the ocean, nor even the other side of the forest. When he was young, he and his brother promised they would chop through the forest to witness the sea. He believed they would hack until not a single tree was left. Since then though, his brother has died, and that was long, long ago. Now, the old woodcutter is left a lonely miser with his promise unfulfilled. He no longer travels to any village because his eyes don't see anymore, as he says. He also claims there are wolves in the woods, but the wolves do not bother him. Still, though aged, his axe has not failed. He is left alone until a stranger knocks on his door one day. This wanderer, an old man, appears wearing an old blanket, a scar across his face, leaning on a staff, but he is filled with age and authority. The wanderer and woodcutter exchange irremarkable words of hospitality until the wanderer says, I am without a home, and I sleep wherever I can. I have wandered all across Saxony. The old woodcutter notes that he remembers his father, long ago, calling England Saxony, but no one does any longer. He takes the wanderer in, the two eat dinner, then they sleep for the night. In the morning, the strange wanderer casts his staff before the woodcutter and demands he pick it up, an act of authority. Why should I do what you tell me to? Because I am a king. Though thinking him mad, the woodcutter picks up the stick and returns it. For it, the wanderer tells him, I am the king of the sections. Many times did I lead them to victory in hard combat, but at the hour that fate decreed, I lost my kingdom. My name is Isern, and I am of the line of Odin. The woodcutter retorts, I do not worship Odin, I worship Christ. Ignoring him, the wanderer tells, I wander the paths of exile, but still I am king, for I have the disc. Do you want to see it? There, the wanderer shows him the disc. The woodcutter touches it, and sees only a quick gleam. The Wanderer explains, It is the Disc of Odin. It has but one side. There is not another thing on earth that has but one side. So long as I hold it in my hand, I shall be king. Immediately, the Woodcutter becomes obsessed with the Disc's power and its promise of wealth and authority. The Woodcutter offers a fictional chest of gold for the Disc, but the Wanderer refuses to part with his treasure. Then you can continue on your way, says the woodcutter. He continues on. The woodcutter chops down the wanderer and the disc falls from his hand. The wanderer falls. The woodcutter marks the place of the disc with his axe, then disposes of the wanderer's body in a nearby river. But when I got back to my house, I looked for the disc, but I couldn't find it. I have been looking for it for years. A simple story of temptation and greed on the surface, but that is only a single surface. Like the woodcutter, the reader's mind's eye is immediately drawn to the disc. The Disc of Odin as it is named in story. Borges contextualizing the disc's existence in terms of Norse slash Germanic pagan myth is important here. The disc is an impossible object of both Borges' fabulous style and of mythology. The impossible objects of Norse mythology, or other branches of Germanic myth, were the tools or weapons of the gods. Odin's spear Gungnir, which he used to impale himself on the world tree, Thor's hammer with its too short handle, and lesser known ones such as Loki's boots that allow him to fly, Sigyn's bowl used to catch the poison that drips into Loki's eyes, then the god Rand's fishing net which catches dead sailors. 
in their function or form, all these objects defy or defeat themselves in certain instances, being used for their opposite intentions. Odin's spear was used to injure himself, and always returns to his hand. Thor's hammer is not a proper hammer with a cut handle. Loki's boots are used for flying, not walking or running. Sigyn's bowl is used not for food, but for poison, while Rand's net is for the dead, not fish for the living. All these objects display the fatalism inherent in northern mythology. The disc's physical impossibility is invoked alongside these miraculous tools of self-negation or opposition. Being so familiar with Germanic myths, as he both read the sagas and studied Old English, Borges is obviously invoking a certain category of self-defeating wondrous object. The impossible objects Borges invokes are the materials used to construct the apocalyptic wolf Fenrir's chains, Glipnir, or in Old Norse, Open One, another self-defeating name. In Norse myth, the dwarves were commissioned by the gods to construct impossibly strong chains to bind the bestial Fenrir until the end of the world, Ragnarok. To craft such a chain, the dwarves required six impossible objects as material, the sound of a cat's footfall, the beard of a woman, the roots of a mountain, the sinews of a bear, the breath of a fish, and the spittle of a bird. All metaphorical, impossible objects which bring about great struggles, each express a complex metaphor in itself, of which Borges' own fictional objects are much the same. Glipnir, as the name suggests, is an equally self-defeating confabulation of an object. It is thin as a ribbon, but stronger than any iron chain, and thus used to bind a cosmic wolf beast until the end of time. The mythological symbolism is deep. Borges casts the disc in the same lineage as these divine and impossible materials. It's no surprise then, as with the use of Glipnir, the disc exists alongside wolves in their binding slash vanishing. The main conflict of the story El Disco, or the disc, is the incursion of that vanishing paganism into a newly Christian world. When the wanderer, who claims a connection to Odin, enters the hut, he is bringing an object of a pagan worldview into a newly christianized world. To the wanderer, the disc is an object of magic and divine authority, rulership of the sections in Saxony. To the woodcutter though, the disc is an impossible object which seems to defy the established mechanistic immaterial laws of this Christian world, or England. It exists as pure magic without a source to the woodcutter. The Wanderer Isern's murder is a similar act steeped in mythological and religious symbolism, a bloody oxymoron of religious conversion, Saxony to England. Even their occupations, woodcutter and wanderer, mirror the clash or passing of paganism to Christianity, a literal representation of settled Christianity expelling wandering paganism. The conversion or transfiguration of symbols, peaceful or violent, is a topic which Borges long mused over in essays like Dialogue of Ascetic and King, Forms of a Legend on Buddhism, and Circular Time on the concept of the eternal return. Isern is the king, the woodcutter the ascetic, and Odin the dead god. If it did not strike yet, Isern is supposed to embody Odin or be a representation of him in Wanderer's garb, the god Odin well known in myth to wander the world in such a state. Isern's role as the Wanderer in Scars mark him as a stand-in for both Odin and Germanic Norse myths in general. He is, after all, of the line of Odin. The stick, or staff, and disc are both signs of kingship and authority, the disc being a divine symbol and the stick or staff being a temporal symbol. The Wanderer's staff is a sign of dominion over the world. When he has the woodcutter pick up his staff, the Wanderer invokes an act of ancient ritual and rulership. He attempts to invoke his authority over the woodcutter, to who, as being of the world of Christianity, it has no effect on. He understands Isern as only an interloper, which he is in this new Christian world. Isern claims rule over the Sections or Seconds. Borges misdirects here to make them an obscure Germanic tribe of the early Middle Ages, either of England or Germany, but the name is likely an obscure joke. Sekjen in Old English is derived from the verb to say or to speak, and shares a root with the word saga, 
the modern English word say even still bears a passing resemblance to it. The Sections are not a true tribe then, but the tribe of storytellers and bards. Ecern is the king of storytellers. Even Ecern's name suggests the phrase Ecernes Dal from Old English which means much iron. Is it not ironic the king much iron is felled by a nameless woodcutter's axe? The felling, or chopping, is another action of significance alongside the disc, parallel deaths and torments of Norse mythology and Christianity. If one takes Ysern to be a representation of Odin, which Borges' symbol suggest, the woodcutter's actions mirror the felling of Irminsul, or the great pillar or tree of the Saxons. The pillar or tree trunk, it's not exactly clear what it was, was likely a representation of the mythological world tree Yggdrasil, or the Axis Mundi of certain mythologies. The structure was destroyed by Charlemagne after his conquest and conversion of the Saxons, though, in the conversion narratives of Europe, the conquest and conversion of pagan peoples and the felling of sacred trees is not uncommon. There was said to be a sacred tree at the Temple of Uppsala in Sweden as well. The Anglo-Saxon missionary, St. Boniface, is said to have done the same when he converted other Germanic peoples. The saint is said to have chopped down Donner's slash Thor's sacred oak to build a church as a challenge to the pagan tribes of Germany. The veneration of these trees being common in the polytheism of the Germanic peoples before the conversion of greater parts of Europe. Borges intends for the killing of the wandering Isern by a woodcutter's axe to invoke the fall of Jormundsul slash Thor's oak, and the conquest of the Christian world over the pagan the cutting down of idols, symbols of an older world view, a literal fall of paganism, or maybe change into a new form. The woodcutter even disposes of Ysern's corpse in a stream slash river, arroyo or river gulch in Spanish. The flowing water of the river connecting to the Christian rite slash symbol of conversion in Christianity and the baptism of Jesus Christ by John the Baptist. Borges intends a synthesis, though. The woodcutter's occupation invokes Jesus of Nazareth's role as a carpenter and draws a parallel between the cross and the world tree. Both are slash were the axial symbols of two conflicting worldviews. In Norse myth, Odin binds himself to the world tree for knowledge and power. In the Christian Gospels, Jesus sacrifices himself upon the cross for humanity, the suffering of the material world and the treasures of the spiritual world. One action invokes the other, even if superficially. It perhaps indulges in perennial philosophy, but it's literature. Borges' intent is not conversion, but playing with the symbolism of these two world concepts. Ysern takes another role in both Norse mythology and Christian folklore as the Wanderer. The story of Gest, or more properly Norna Gest, in Scandinavian folklore slash sagas, and the Wandering Jew in Christian folklore both said to be immortal wanderers cursed slash blessed to roam until the end of the world. Though the origins of the Nornagest tale are obscure and probably harken back to primeval legends, in the varying tales slash versions of the story, Nornagest, or simply Gest, was said to be blessed by the Norns or fates of Norse mythology to live and war forever until a certain candle was melted away. To make him immortal, his parents snuffed the candle to keep him invulnerable and alive forever. Nornagest lived the proud warrior's life for hundreds of years until the rise of Christianity. It was only then he could embrace death. After accepting baptism in the court of Norway, he burned the candle out and then perished. At least according to that version of the tale. In Christian folklore, the wandering Jew, sometimes known as a Hazawaris, though having varying names depending on source and period, was cursed to wander forever for some slight against Jesus usually for cursing Jesus on his way to the crucifixion. Ahasuerus' divine punishment, invoking the Hebrew punishment of Cain, who was forced to live as an exiled pariah for the crime of killing his brother Abel, the Mark of Cain. Though Ahasuerus' wandering state invokes older figures in both Europe and the Middle East, while also being reminiscent of Odysseus' exile and journey in the Odyssey. Unlike their Greek or other counterparts though, both Nornagest and Ahasuerus must live forever until the end of their respective worlds. Nornagest until he melts out the wax of his candle, and thus the night of paganism, and Ahasuerus until Judgment Day in the Christian tradition, or the coming of the Messiah in the Jewish tradition. What do the literary symbols of Nornagest and Ahasuerus have to do with Isern and El Disco, though? 
Eastern represents the expiration of the pagan world while also invoking the Christian, the transformation or transference of Saxony to England. The woodcutter's desire to hack through those woods represents the transformation, likely brutal, of his world. He desires to witness the sea, but ends up dumping a body in a river. There are associations of the forest with paganism and the sea with Christianity, but don't forget the Vikings also held the sea likewise. The old pagan magic of the impossible disc cannot exist for the woodcutter. The disc of Odin is an object which cannot be in a world of Christian metaphysics. But, as there are still wolves alive in those woods, the last whispers of paganism live on in the fringes. The woodcutter's response rings true, I worship Christ. The disc cannot exist for him. Odin is likewise similarly bound to rule and wander until Ragnarok, the death of the gods. Though, even once submerged in Christianity, Odin, and his other parallel figures of Germanic myth, were often difficult to expunge from cultural memory, often being bolderized into warrior figures such as Hearn the Hunter or Wad in England. In areas of Scandinavian culture or influence, it was often feared Odin, often conflated with Nornagest in these retellings, would reappear as an evil spirit and tempt the converted Christians back to paganism with his power, the wandering soul of Odin literally intruding into the homes of his former worshippers the gods said to be bitter against those who turned against him. Herbert J. Brandt observed in Dreams and Death, Borges' El Libro de Irina, that when Borges' stories have a direct antagonist, his antagonistic figures are often the intruder which puts the dreamer in danger. They often incur into the story as a sort of foreign, supernatural figure, often as the animus to the protagonist's anima, or vice versa. They represent the missing other, or shadow double to something, Eastern likely fulfilling, or stealing, the role of the lonely woodcutter's long dead brother in story. These scenarios were often real of Borges, who suffered nightmares of infinite repetition and regular insomnia, then followed by wandering the streets of Buenos Aires, or whatever city he was in at the time, to cope with his restlessness. These figures in story, like Eastern, are without a stable identity and are often a tangled knot of themes, histories, and shifting content, which Borges often employed for his impossible objects. Sarah Barber Nabad calls these items, and it could be extended to these figures as well, like Isern, avatares del objeto impossible, avatars of the impossible object. There then are two avatars of the abstract. Isern, and thus the disc, are interlopers into both the dream of the story and the Christian world concept it depicts. An autobiographical interpretation of the story often sees, or does not see, Isern and the woodcutter acting as Borges' own doubles. Both are subject to blindness, the woodcutter's own blindness alongside living in the dark woods, then Isern's scarred face which invokes Odin and his use of staff slash stick to travel the world. Isern represents Borges' interest in the ancient north, and the woodcutter his anglophilia. Borges too often felt divided between the heritage of his family in Argentina's military and his own role as a writer. The guise he assumes as a storyteller is never explicit. Remember, the woodcutter purposely avoids giving the reader a name. There is much more from Borges that can be drawn on to show how deeply connected these entanglements are. One of his few stories that have an explicit romance, Urique, or Urica, plays off similar themes to El Disco, but in the modern day. It is about a chance meeting in England between a Colombian professor, Javier Otorora, and a Norwegian woman, Ureka, who cannot pronounce each other's names due to their native languages. In the winter snows of York, the two knowingly reenact the doomed romance of Sigurd and Brynhild, even assuming those names, from the Norse Vursunga saga. The actions are layered heavily with the fatalism inherent in Germanic mythology slash folklore, such as how Odin appears in the saga as a wise, scarred wanderer who can predict the future. Urique's autobiographical elements have no end of speculation because Borges' tombstone bears the line from the Norse saga, he took the sword Gram and laid the naked metal between them. Though, as Borges begins the short story in character, my story will be faithful to reality, or at least to my personal recollection of reality, which is the same thing. 
Its mythological component is obvious, as the sexual union which ends the story is equated with death, and thus oblivion, the end of time. The howl of a wolf, long extinct from England, in the story foreshadows the end, the breaking of chains. Then there is the story The Witness, about the obscure, unremarked death Borges imagines of the last Anglo-Saxon pagan become Englishman to ever witness the true religious rites to Odin slash Wotan. He dies forgotten in a stable to the sound of church bells, mourned only by fading wolf prints in the clay on the edge of the forest, the perishing of paganism unremarked in the newly Christian world, the story asking what fades and is lost forever with the death of each human, the death of image and sound in memory of a witness, what voice or scenes only they saw and can recall. As Borges warns, with the death of each person, the world is a little poorer, unless that is there is some universal memory. But what of that dead god? Norse mythology, and likely its lost cousins Anglo-Saxon mythology and other branches of Germanic culture, is one of the select mythic structures that explicitly tells of the death of the gods. This mythic structure in history has an implied end in Doomsday in Ragnarok, or Garadamrung. All three stories, El Disco, Urike, and The Witness, are preparations for death or death in dreams through the symbolism of mythology, loss, and lost mythology, the fading of form and memory and content into oblivion. As the character Urike or Urika remarks on the history of England and how it once belonged to Norway, if, that is, anyone can possess anything, or anything can really be lost. I will end here with a reading of an interlude from the essay The Dialogues of Ascetic and King, a brief prose poem as it were. In the court of Olaf Tregerson, who had been converted in England to the faith of Christ, an old man arrived one night dressed in a dark cape and with the brim of his hat over his eyes. The king asked him if he knew how to do anything. The stranger answered that he knew how to play the harp and tell stories. He sang some ancient airs, told of Gudran and Gunnar, then spoke of the birth of Odin. He said that the three fates came, that the first two pronounced great happiness, but the third, in a rage, said, You will not live longer than the candle burning by your side. His parents put the candle out so that Odin would not die with it. Olaf Tryggvason didn't believe the story. The stranger, insisting it was true, took out a candle and lit it. As the others watched it burn, he said it was late and that he had to leave. When the candle was consumed, they searched for him. A few steps from the king's house, Odin was lying dead. This excerpt is sometimes titled as The Birth of Odin, or simply Odin. Until the death of videos, I'd like to give a thanks to my supporter, the Gel Samini family. 